In this lecture, we'll continue our examination of the evolutionary history of hominins. In the last lecture, we covered the period from roughly 6 million years ago to 2 million years ago. Today, we'll examine the next phase of the story, the early Pleistocene epoch. The Pleistocene epoch as a whole runs from about 1.8 million years ago to about 10,000 years ago. The early part that we're focused on in this lecture runs from 1.8 million years ago to 780,000 years ago. We'll look at the middle and late Pleistocene in the next two lectures. The whole epoch is often referred to as the Ice Age, as it was a period of lower average global temperatures. Glaciers spread throughout the northern and southern latitudes, trapping much of the world's water and making for lower sea levels and generally drier climates. Contrary to popular imagination, though, most parts of the world were not trapped in a permanent winter, and away from the glaciers themselves, the climate was quite mild and comfortable. Those changes in climate brought on many environmental changes around the world and probably drove the evolutionary developments that we're concerned with here. It's during the early Pleistocene period that hominins go from a varied tribe of many different African species that looked more like apes than humans to something very much like us. This lecture will be devoted to Homo erectus, arguably the most successful hominin species ever to evolve, ourselves not excluded. As some modern paleoanthropologists classify things, Homo erectus lived on Earth for 1.5 million years and spread throughout much of three continents. By comparison, Homo sapiens only appeared a couple hundred thousand years ago, and while we have settled more of the planet, we're also in the process of making most of it unlivable. Anyway, for such a widespread and long-lived species, it should be no surprise that there are many unanswered questions and unresolved debates surrounding Erectus. In fact, about the only thing universally agreed upon by paleoanthropologists is that all hominin fossils outside of Africa belong in the genus Homo. Australopithecines never left Africa. The question then becomes, which Homo species left Africa first? We're going to see that there's a lot of debate and uncertainty about that question, but generally most paleoanthropologists agree that the first African emigrants belonged to Homo erectus, not Homo habilis. Nevertheless, there is a lot about that migration still open to debate, much of which is due to the fact that Homo erectus fossils show so much variation. Here, we run into one of the most basic philosophical debates in paleoanthropology that between the lumpers and the splitters. According to the lumper school of thought, when defining paleo species, we should be conservative and use fewer species names. The lumpers like to lump fossils together into large categories. They're willing to accept more intraspecific variation, that is more differences between fossils assigned to the same species, in order to reduce the number of species used. Lumpers thus use Homo erectus as a sort of catch-all term for early Pleistocene hominin that wasn't Homo habilis or Paranthropus. Because remember, Homo habilis and a couple species of Paranthropus were hanging around in Africa for hundreds of thousands of years after the earliest Homo erectus fossils. If you think about biological classification as sorting fossils into boxes, lumpers prefer to use a few big boxes each of which will hold many skulls. The splitter school of thought takes the opposite approach. They prefer to minimize intraspecific variation. That is, they prefer that all fossils assigned to one species look very similar to one another. But splitters are willing to create more species names to compensate. When it comes to the fossils that lumpers call Homo erectus, splitters want to divide the species up more or less geographically. Homo ergaster is applied to African fossils that would otherwise be called erectus. Homo erectus is reserved for Asian fossils since erectus was first defined based on Asian fossils. And Homo antecessor has been proposed for some European fossils. So the splitters prefer to use many smaller boxes and each box will hold only a few skulls. Meanwhile, the skulls from Demonisi, Georgia, are odd enough that no one is quite sure what to call them, so they continue to be called erectus. Is any of this significant? Not really. 
because remember that all these are paleo species and they're useful concepts only so long as they help us to understand human evolution. It's impossible to say whether these different groups of hominins were really reproductively isolated interbreeding populations. Different scholars with different theories to test will choose to use the lumper approach or splitter approach, depending on which is more useful for their particular questions. Unfortunately, that means that students like us need to be familiar with all the different terminology if we want to understand the different theories. That being said, the general consensus among paleoanthropologists seems to be forming that all the early Pleistocene fossils from Africa, Asia, and Europe all constitute one large, very long-lived species with a high degree of variation within it, both spatial variation and variation over time. So what do all Homo erectus share in common? Put simply, erectus represents the first stage of human evolution where, to the untrained eye, the hominin looks more like us than it does a chimp. For example, his body size and limb proportions are much more similar to ours, and his brain is larger than earlier species. In general, erectus adults seem to have weighed over 100 pounds, males probably significantly more so, and they stood well over five foot tall. The average height was probably around 5'6". Limb proportions, both relative to one another and to the trunk of the body, were more or less similar to modern humans. In fact, aside from very specific anatomical details, the postcranial skeleton is essentially the same as that of modern humans. Where erectus differs from modern humans is in the high degree of sexual dimorphism the skeletons seem to show. The differences in size between males and females seem to have been greater than in most modern human populations. Also, the skull shape and anatomy tend to be different from modern humans being much more robust and strongly built for a rough and dangerous lifestyle. Of course, the biggest difference in cranial anatomy is just size. Homo erectus skulls usually have a range of about 700 to 1250 cubic centimeters, with an average of about 900 cubic centimeters. That average is about 65 to 70% the cranial capacity of modern humans. So erectus still had small brains by comparison. Of course, it is important to remember that erectus was a very long-lived species. There was a general increase in cranial capacity over time, with the smallest brains almost always belonging to the earliest skulls. In fact, if the various numbers are plotted out, you find that early small Homo erectus skulls are about the same size as large Homo habilis skulls, and late large Homo erectus skulls are about the same size as the smaller skulls of later Homo species. In other words, the Homo erectus trends show a clear transition from small-brained African Homo to large-brained modern Homo. That ought not be a surprise given what we know about evolution. So let's trace the fossil record for erectus and see what we can tell about how and why it evolved the way it did. The earliest erectus fossils appear in Africa by about 1.7 million years ago, and it's universally agreed upon that Homo erectus evolved from earlier Homo habilis populations in the same area, sometime between maybe 2 million and 1.8 million years ago. Whatever caused some habilis groups to evolve into erectus, this represented a major shift in evolutionary strategy. We might even consider it the critical turning point of the entire story because Erectus very quickly did something that no other hominin ever had. It left Africa. Now, your textbook, and in fact, most paleoanthropologists, makes a huge deal out of this migration, and it is a big deal. But it's important for us to understand why that's important. It's important because hominins had been evolving in Africa for millions of years and had not expanded their territory outside of East and South Africa in that time. Erectus is the first example of any real expansion of territory. On the other hand, the distance he went and the time it took are really unimpressive. The earliest African fossils are about 1.7 million years old, 
but Homo erectus must have evolved earlier than that because the Dimonisi fossils outside of Africa are 1.8 million years old. So let's take 1.8 million years ago as the minimum age of the earliest Homo erectus in Africa as well. The earliest Homo erectus fossils in Indonesia are about 1.6 million years old. Our minds do the math, 1.8 minus 1.6 equals 0.2. And since 0.2 is such a small number, we assume that this is a really fast migration. But the units here are millions of years and 0.2 million years is 200,000 years. Looked at that way, it's not a very fast process at all. The earliest Homo erectus fossils in Africa are in the Turkana region of Kenya. To make the migration to Java in Indonesia, Homo erectus would have had to walk north through North Africa and the Middle East, then east across India and Southeast Asia, and then south to Java the route would cover about 8,500 miles. So between 1.8 and 1.6 million years, there's 200,000 years of time to make that journey. When you do the math, 8,500 miles and 200,000 years, that comes to less than the distance of a football field, about 75 yards per year. So Erectus was not a great explorer, nor even a great traveler. He was as much a homebody as his ancestors, most individuals probably were born, lived, and died all in the same small area. What is different is that from one generation to the next, those territories drifted across the landscape in a way that had never happened before. Why they moved for Homo erectus and not for Homo habilis is not entirely certain. It has traditionally been assumed that bigger brains made Erectus a better hunter, and migration was a result of following game animals as they migrated. But our better understanding of just how small early Erectus brains were makes that seem unlikely. In general, it seems that early Erectus would have been no better at hunting than Habilis, and it was the earliest Erectus that migrated. But what about those African fossils? I've already alluded to many of the characteristics that set them apart from other African hominins, bigger bodies, different proportions, and so on. We have a better understanding of erectus physiology than most other human ancestors because as a more recent widespread species, we have many more examples to work with and more complete examples. Several almost complete erectus skeletons have been discovered, including the Nariokotome boy, a skeleton of an erectus boy found near Lake Turkana, Kenya in 1984. It dates to about 1.6 million years ago, that is after the initial migration out of Africa, and it represents an eight-year-old boy who was already five foot three. If the boy had survived into adulthood, he may have been as much as six feet tall. Outside of Africa, the earliest Erectus fossils date to about 1.8 million years ago, even older than the earliest African finds. These earliest immigrants from Africa were found at the site of Dimonisi in Georgia, not the state east of Alabama, but the country in the Caucasus region separating southeastern Europe from southwestern Asia. The Dimonisi finds are odd for a variety of reasons. First, the skulls all have very small brain sizes for erectus, but that's to be expected for an early skull. More troublesome is the fact that the various skulls really don't look all that much like one another or any other erectus. One skull even looks more like habilis than it does erectus. How can we explain this? Some people have suggested that Dimonisi represents members of several species, that the first migration out of Africa wasn't just Erectus, but a variety of species that moved together. If that is true, it would be very unexpected, because primates typically do not live in multi-species groups. Others suggest that this was an earlier migration of an otherwise unknown population that died out without leaving descendants, then a second migration of more typical Homo erectus populated Asia and Africa. But the most likely explanation is just that Homo erectus was a very variable species and these are just a particularly diverse sample. The other interesting thing about the Dimonisi finds is the skull of an old man who died with only one tooth. 
More interesting than that is the evidence that he had lived several years with only one tooth. This man would have been largely incapable of eating the same sorts of foods that other Homo erectus ate. So how did he survive? The others in his community must have processed the food and supplied him, perhaps in the same way that modern hunter-gatherers solve this problem. In those cultures, younger people pre-chew food for their elderly who can then swallow the pulp. In any case, this is very strong evidence for a highly developed sense of community among the Dimenisi people. They certainly weren't the popular, stereotypical, uncaring, brutish cavemen if they were regularly providing this crippled old man with food for years. In Asia, the earliest Homo erectus fossils have been found in Indonesia on the island of Java. In fact, these are not only the earliest chronologically, but also the first to be discovered. The very first Homo erectus fossils were discovered in 1891 near Trinil by the Dutch scholar Eugène Dubois. At the time, most scholars agreed with Darwin that humans had evolved in Africa. Dubois doubted that, though, and thought Southeast Asia was a better candidate. He went to Java with the stated intention of discovering the missing link between men and apes. Within a couple years, he discovered a Homo erectus skull and a femur. These were the earliest human fossils yet found anywhere in the world, and consequently, for the next 30 years, many scholars believed humans had evolved in Asia. It wasn't until Dart's discovery of the Tong child in 1924 that paleoanthropologists took a second look at Africa. The Indonesian examples of Homo erectus, which you'll still occasionally hear called Java man, all date from about 1.6 million years ago to 1 million years ago, except for the very unusual finds from the site of Ngandong, which your textbook dates to less than 100,000 years ago. However, even more recent analysis has pushed that back to 500,000 to 150,000 years ago. That's still extraordinarily late, hundreds of thousands of years later than any other nearby Homo erectus population. This is another good example of how evolution is not goal-oriented. For whatever reason, a population of erectus was successful at Ngandong, for an extremely long time after other populations had died out or evolved into other species entirely. Just because there's something new, evolution doesn't necessarily get rid of the old. It sticks with what works, and in this case, Homo erectus just worked. Elsewhere in Asia, the most common erectus fossils come from China, and especially from the cave of Zhokodian. These fossils were also discovered quite early in the 1920s and 1930s when many scholars were still convinced by Dubois that Asia was where humans had evolved. The Zhokodian fossils used to be called Peking Man because the cave is near the city of Beijing, which used to be called Peking. These fossils date after the Javan examples to about 780,000 years ago, but they're much more common and they're associated with stone tools. Older interpretations of Jokodian really defined the erectus who lived there as the classic cavemen. They were thought to be effective hunters. After all, there were stone tools and cut marks on animal bones. How could that be anything but evidence of hunting? There were round depressions in the cave floor full of ash, so the cavemen were using fire and hearths, too. Newer interpretations of the cave, though, turned that picture on its head. The animal bones were scavenged at best, and the hearths are all natural features that had little at all to do with fire. Even the cave as home idea has been challenged, with some scholars suggesting it was a hyena den, and the erectus were hyena food, prey rather than predator. As a better understanding of Jokodian emerged, we've had to dial back how much of ourselves we see in the Homo erectus who lived there. Earlier scholars fell prey to the fallacy of anthropomorphizing their subjects. They wanted to see these Homo erectus as human, and so they interpreted the evidence in that light. But they were attributing modern human behaviors to a species that is very much not a modern human. Interestingly enough, 
While the inhabitants of Jokodian seem not to have made use of fire, other homoerecticites do show some convincing evidence that they were able to control fire even earlier. Van der Werk Cave, a homoerecticite in South Africa, dates to about one million years ago and has good evidence of hearths. Perhaps this was a technology enjoyed by only some Homo erectus populations. As we'll see in a bit, different Homo erectus populations used different styles of stone tools, and this diversity seems to have extended to other technologies as well. Evidence is only just beginning to emerge about an early Homo erectus presence in Western Europe, but it appears that they also made it to Spain. In the Atapuerca region of Spain, Erectus-like fossils have been found dating as far back as 1.2 million years ago. The Spanish scholars who found them suggest that they should be considered a different species, Homo antecessor, because they're quite different from Asian and African erectus. As we'll see in the next lecture, other paleoanthropologists disagree with this conclusion. These finds are so new that it's hard to know what the future consensus will be on them. One last point on Erectus, which is technology. As far back as 2.5 million years ago, African hominins had been making stone tools that belonged to the Oldowan industry. When Erectus migrated out of Africa, it took Oldowan with it. Oldowan tools are found at Dimanisi and very similar tools are found at Jokodian. Oldowan technology is very simple. Its tools are made with unifacial techniques where flakes are removed from only one side of the core. This made for a very sharp, but irregular and fragile cutting edge. Consequently, Oldowan tools dulled quickly. They were made, used, and discarded all in short order. In Africa, about 1.6 million years ago, Homo erectus began making much more sophisticated stone tools in a variety of forms, which is called the Acheulean industry. The centerpiece of the Acheulean industry is the biface, a tool with flakes removed from both sides of the core. This produces a stronger, straighter edge, but one that's less sharp than a uniface, and it can be used in a wider range of activities. The most common Acheulean biface is the hand axe, a kind of Paleolithic Swiss Army knife used for cutting, chopping, digging, and any other tasks at hand. Acheulean tools were usually symmetrical, showing a sense of planning and forethought. They were also curated, that is, made now, possibly used, but kept for future use again later. Both are characteristics not seen in Oldowan tools. There are also more kinds of Acheulean stone tools than Oldowan stone tools. This shows that Erectus had a sense of planning and knew that tools would be needed again in the future but also that different tools would be better suited to different tasks. All of these are significantly more sophisticated ways of thinking than is evidenced in Oldowan technology. But Erectus started out using Oldowan and did for hundreds of thousands of years before the Acheulean appeared in East Africa. So what changed? It's impossible to say, but perhaps early Homo erectus populations before 1.6 million years ago weren't capable of the sorts of thinking necessary for an Acheulean technology. The new technology then would reflect cognitive evolution within the species. While we can look at the changing skeleton to track the evolution of our bodies, we must look at changing culture, that is technology, to see the evolution of our minds. One final note on the Acheulean. It starts in Africa at 1.6 million years ago. But by that time, there were already Oldowan using Homo erectus living all over Asia and Europe. But by about 1 million years ago, Acheulean tools are found across most of the Homo erectus range. So how can this be explained? Independent invention is a possibility, but the new tools are similar enough to one another to suggest one community learned by actually seeing the tools made by others. Clearly, there must have been continued movement between all these regions to bring the new technology to Asia and Europe. In other words, the African Erectus maintained some sort of contact with their Asian and European cousins, 
this wasn't a branch of the family that moved away and was never heard from again. At least sporadic movement out of, and probably into, Africa continued over the entirety of Erectus's time frame. This is the scene then, as the Middle Pleistocene epic begins about 780,000 years ago. Homo erectus populations live throughout Africa, Asia, and Southern Europe using Acheulean technology. They maintain some tenuous contact with one another while they pursue slightly different lifestyles in different regions of the Old World. In the next lecture, we'll see what happens during the Middle Pleistocene.